picks up a little bit. Good morning. It's Wednesday, October 22nd, 2014, 9 o'clock, and we're in the Cinder Hearing Room at the Courthouse Square, 555 Court Street Northeast in Salem for our weekly Board of Commissioners meeting. We start the meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We had a presentation from SEDCOR planned. Uh, apparently they're going to come next week and make that presentation. So we'll go right to public comment. And we do have one person signed up, uh, Ron Sturba. Ron, would you come over to the desk there on the side and tell us what you'd like to? Good morning. My name's Ron Sturba. I live at 520th Street Northeast here in Salem. I want to say good morning to the commissioners, the staff, and guests. I'm here as a concerned citizen. Some of the knowledge that I gained over the 40 years with the employment with the company here locally. And that involved working on underground buried cables and repairing them during flood times. So I have a little bit of knowledge of the uh, information that I do have for you. I put together um, the Oregon Technical Resource Guide. The Oregon Technical Resource Guide, or TRG, uh, halfway down your page on the front cover there, you'll see uh, the part that it talks about uh, flood TRG. I'm going to work with that section. As we turn the page, uh, Mr. Bennard uh, was the director of the Land Conservation Development Commission. Their task was to address natural hazards in our community. Take those community hazards, a culmination throughout the state, and come up with a guide. They use FEMA guidelines and the policies by the state of Oregon's different agencies to come up with a comprehensive plan for protecting our communities. It's endorsed by Governor Kitzhaber. I'm going to have you move to the next page here, Oregon Statewide Planning Goals. Paragraph C, under implementation. <laughs> Sentence number two and three, AB, allow an opportunity for citizen review and comment on the new inventory information and results of the evaluation and incorporate such information into the comprehensive plan as necessary. Adopt or amend as necessary. I feel what I'm bringing to the table today should at least be considered. It may not be a plan, but I'd like to at least get the information out to the people to see what's happening in the community. I am a pilot, been a pilot for 42 years, so I get to look down at our city and our community uh, from a different perspective. So today what my uh, conversation is going to be about is the Mental Island footbridge. Uh, several years ago, the city of Salem signed an agreement with the Stern Wheeler uh, operator here and came up with a plan that once the city put in the bridge at the Stern Wheeler Company or people involved with the LLC would receive $50,000 a year for five years for a loss of revenue. Now there are stipulations on there and I believe that um, in this case, the last permit that came through was that of the United States Coast Guard, and that allowed the uh, progress of the Mental Island Bridge to continue. Prior to that, I had sent in my uh, concerns to the United States Coast Guard, in which they agreed with me, and the city of Salem had to change half of that plan. What I'm getting into now is I'm going to have you move to the next page. Um, 
Local government should consider programs to manage stormwater and runoff as a means to help address flood and landslide hazards. That's in under implementation, excuse me, and uh, sentence number two. As we move through the guide and going through planning for natural hazards, there is a committee that was set up to take information from the different groups statewide. This includes the Oregon State Police Emergency Response Group, as well as planners throughout the city to come up with this plan. Um, in, I'm going to take you to page, um, the next page, it's several three away, chapter 417, which is located at the bottom of the page. It's called section three, and it talks about the um, goal 3.1.1, goal seven, and I'll, I'll take you down to the bottom. Avoid obstructing floodwater flow. No development should occur in a floodway of, a portion, of this portion. The next page, 2.3.2 floodway, take you to the middle of that paragraph. The regulations require that the floodway be kept open and free from development or other structures so the flood flows are not obstructed or diverted onto other properties. Part of this statement here is why I'm here today. And as we move on to the next one, strengthening setback requirements, take you to the middle of that. New development is required to be set back from the top of the bank of a stream or river or from a mapped floodway. Now, under a, the next page, floodway enhancements, is a little diagram on the floodway and flood plains. Now, a flood plain is where the water eventually ends up all the way out to the edges of the stream. The floodway is where your stream is, where the current is the strongest and the most turbulent. That's a floodway. This middle mental island footbridge is, according to the maps that I have on the, fly, on the uh, floodways, this is in, in the middle of that floodway. Not in the middle of the floodway, but it encroached on the floodway. As I move on to the Oregon Department of Transportation, it's a page uh, that I have here. It's a letter that I wrote to the Oregon Department of Transportation. And I wanted to cite some safety hazards that were going on to them. This was in July, take it back, February 6th of 2014, and it basically lets them know that there's hazards. These hazards were brought to me by people in the community. And I said, we have to have some concerns about this, about building this bridge in a floodway. They ignored my letter, never got any response as I sit here today. And as we go on to the next picture, or I'm sorry, next page. I have uh, some of the ideas at that time in February that I suggested. Now, as we move into the first picture page here, excuse me. This is a picture of the Willamette River taken from the Marion Street Bridge, closer to the West Salem side. And you can see how turbulent the water is. The high water is where the Marion or Minto Island footbridge is going to be built in on the other side of the river. It's not the exact spot, but it is several hundred yards to the south of that location. Now this was the flood in 96. I did take that picture myself. I did work uh, many hours on repairs for floods. As we go to the next picture, this one was taken from my aircraft in July of this year, July the 28th. And if you take a look at the amount of silt that has come down 
Mill Creek into the slough. I'm finding this more alarming after the flood two years ago in the flooding at Salem Hospital off the creek there. My concerns are that the records of the contract with the city of Salem and the stern wheeler did not address these problems because they are building up. That is the silt at the mouth of Mill Creek. That's my concern. As we get into that, I won't get into the technical guide, the research guide, but it talks about debris dams. And debris dams are formed when a structure is placed in the water or the floodway and debris starts to pile up. In this photo here, you can see that the, uh, the soil is really quite built up. I find it very hard to believe that the city of Salem would pay $50,000 a year to pull the stern wheeler over this silt. Now this silt here has been building the last couple years. And I believe four years ago that contract might have been a good one to take a look at that particular problem of lost revenue for the stern wheeler. But now that the silt has come up, there's an issue that comes up that I look at is, how do we protect the community from upstream flooding? Is the city of Salem's new city hall gonna be affected? With the bridge in place, we no longer can get a dredge in there to clean that silt out. I went to the city more than a year ago and asked Mrs. Norris about moving the bridge to Bellevue, which is just on the south side of Boise Cascade. She says at that time, the uh, um, okay from the railroad department to put a crossing in was not accessible. It just wasn't going to happen. Uh, the railroad was staying firm with their belief in not another crossing. Well, we've seen that with the city councilors working with railroad crossings and the waterfront project now. So with this not being able to dredge and the, the land becoming higher at that point, the water coming out of Mill Creek is going to be at a higher level, which in the guy talks about raising the elevation, which increases the flooding. My concerns are here. I would like to see the bridge moved. I was once a um, chairperson for Parks in West Salem, and I got a, that was early on in the 90s, and I really enjoy the park. I enjoy Minto Island, but I think it needs to be taken um, another look at the safety of this project. The bridge, if it goes in uh, south of Boise, and maybe not quite to Bellevue, it can still access the path on Minto Island, which is what the, the present bridge does. What it does do, if you come off at that point by Boise, is raise the elevation. The stern boat, wheeler boat, can get underneath. And then we have access to dredge that out. I think Oregon State Parks should put in a boat loading ramp at the south end of the slough. This would definitely open up the recreational side of that slough. What it's going to do if this continues to build up that silt, an algae bloom, stagnant water, mosquitoes. I think the Oregon State Parks can do a better job on this. I'm not against the bridge. I'm talking about safety here. That's what this is all about. So at this point, I'd like to conclude and thank you very much for your, your time in this matter. And uh, I'm gonna continue with the other agencies to have them address my concerns because I think it's important that this channel be opened up. And with the bridge at that position, that location, we are uh, putting ourselves at risk for more flooding. Thank you. Next item is our consent calendar, and I believe Commissioner Cameron will do that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
I move the consent calendar. First item under Board of Commissioners, ratification of resolution 14R-6, increasing change fund for the Wheatland Ferry on 12, uh, 2 14 from $100 to $200. Approved letter from Marion County Public Safety Coordinating Council to the Oregon Criminal Justice Commission regarding House Bill 3194 Administrative Rules. Next under Business Services Human Resources. Approve recommendation to change the unit designation for Department Specialist 3, position number 2332 from Unit 12 unrepresentative represented to Unit 6 represented. Under Human Resources, approve recommendation to update the classification specification and to adjust salary range upward for the Community Services Director. Under Human Resources, approve recommendation to adjust salary range upward for business services director under the health department approve amendment 19 to the intergovernmental agreement with oregon health authority to add 192,223 dollars and 12 cents for the operation of community addictions and mental health services and finally under legal counsel to approve a settlement order in usdc case number six 12 CV 01866 TC in Eichhorn versus Marion County. I'll second the motion. All right, so we move and seconded to approve our consent calendar this morning. Any further discussion? I just want to point out that there's a letter from the Public Safety Council, as uh, Commissioner Cameron read, and we will have a little bit more conversation about that at the Community Corrections Board meeting. Okay. <clears throat> Anything else? I'll call a question. All in favor say aye. 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 The motion passes. Aye. Thank you. We have one action item this morning. It's under public works. We consider adoption of an inter administrative ordinance granting case ZCCP CU 14003, which is Portland General Electric Clerk's mm -hmm. File 5687. And Joe Fenimore, would you explain that, please? Yes. Good morning, commissioners. For the record, this is Joe Fenimore. Um, this item before you is an application to change the currently plan designation from rural residential to public, change the zone from acreage residential to public, and a conditional use to establish a solar power generating facility on 52-acre parcel in the 5200 block of Auburn Road. <clears throat> the hearings officer held a public hearing on the application on July 2nd and issued a recommendation that the board grant the request. The board conducted a public hearing on September 10th and approved the request subject to conditions. The conditions include right-of-way dedication, road improvements, removal of a fence in the right-of-way, stormwater management, installing and maintaining a vegetative buffer. That's the middle of the sound study. It was determined that not all the uses in the P-Zone were appropriate for the property and a limited use overlay was applied. It should be noted that two of the conditions of approval in Exhibit B um, were slightly modified from the hearings officer's recommendation. Condition 5 originally required the widening of the gravel portion of Hamden Lane to be centered on the existing paved section of the road. I'm at the hearing a neighboring property owner um, was concerned that if the gravel had to be centered on the paved section, that it would um, interfere with the ditch and some landscape improvements they'd done along their property frontage and asked that, that the board consider or public works consider amending that condition. I did meet with public works staff and they determined that, that it doesn't necessarily have to be centered and they, they suggest we remove that particular requirement from the condition. So it still requires a gravel to be 20 foot wide gravel, but they're willing to give them some flexibility not to have it specifically in the center of that gravel portion. And the other condition that was slightly modified is the condition number nine in exhibit B, the last one. Um, it requires a noise mitigation plan before the solar array can go in. Um, the condition written by the hearings officer referred to a sound study and a site plan study, but um, in talking with the consultant, it seemed that, that Really what it needed was a mitigation plan to meet the requirement. It'll be specific to the site. Um, the applicant's representative, Mr. Tross, reviewed the proposed conditions and had no concerns. The ordinance and findings have been prepared and notice of adoption was given on October 15th. Huh. It's now ready for formal adoption. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Are there questions? Commissioner? That was hung already. Yes, uh, thank you, Joe. I thought this was um, 
very thorough, very well put together, good reflection of what we discussed at the hearing. Uh, my question is that we had a number of people that were from the neighborhood that expressed concerns at the hearing. Uh, and as it says in the uh, write-up that you did, the applicant responded to and addressed each of the topics and it goes through and talks about the noise levels and the fence and the use of pesticides and herbicides or not. Um, and those are not necessarily in conditions, right? So, and I'm not suggesting that we add them as conditions. I'm just trying to make sure that things that were represented at the hearing in terms of the applicant working with the neighbors, is there any, are there any remedies for the neighbors if they're feeling like things aren't going the way that was promised, or how is that going to work? There is not a specific remedy, no. Okay. So they've said they're going to do this a certain way. When the, when the, if they go forward with it and the plans come in, they will review the site plan, show that, make sure the fence is there. The vegetative buffer has to be there. Okay, so the fence does have to be there right. as part of yes. the plan, right? right? Even though it's not listed as a condition. Specific condition, correct. Right, okay. All right, thank you. Uh, Joe, my only question is remind me, just uh, you must have had some noise concerns that uh, we've heard and uh, and then the, the uh, center of the road driveway or roadway. Anything else that people were concerned about that came up in the hearing? I think originally there was some concern about the property not being entirely fenced and with transients walking through, but at the hearing the applicant right, stated that care for, they're definitely going to fence the area it was for, their own, for their own security, the entire property. I feel a need to, to make that a condition, but uh, we've already discussed it a little bit. You're saying it's going to be done, I guess, then what do you do if it wouldn't be done? We can add it as a condition to bring it back. That's an option. I don't know that I want that. I don't that. know that we want to hold it up. Yeah. I don't know if we can, I don't know if you can, can or I don't know if they can add it at this point specifically and can we can change I mean, the exhibit. Can I just ask Certainly. you, by representing here today that it's part of the project design, is that enough? That's, so I guess that's a question. That could be one, one part of it. Uh, I'd be hesitant to add a condition right. at this point in time because you've already closed your hearing and, and made your ruling on it. Uh, so you basically would have to be bringing it back to do that to give the uh, applicant a opportunity to respond to that new condition. Right, and if I could just add, it says, I mean, on page three, it says the site will be secured with a fence and monitored by remote cameras and alarms. So, I mean, it actually is written it is, yeah. in the, as part of the documentation, yeah. so. Yeah, Mr. Chair, for me. Certainly. Yeah, I, I think it is, it, I think the commissioner just brought up a good point. It says it's going to be there, but also the, the uh, testimony we heard from PGE said that they are definitely going to do it because it's going to protect their own assets that they have in the in the facility. So I think that we'd be covered by those. I mean, one of them says that it has to be, it is going to be, and the other one is they said they were going to. So I think I'm good with that. I, I am too. I just don't know if you have any recourse if it didn't happen, and, and we're going to say it will. All right, I'm all right. Anything else? Well... So, um, Mr. Chair, I would move that the board adopt the this administrative ordinance granting case number ZCCPCU 14-003, Portland General Electric Clerk's file number 5687. Um, and I don't think there's anything else I need to say on the motion. Right. We're just adopting the ordinance. And I'll second. All right, so moved and seconded to adopt the administrative ordinance on Portland General Electric Clerk's file 5687. Any further discussion? I don't hear any, so all in favor say aye. 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 Okay, the motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Well, that was a rather short agenda. Without a presentation, the last thing to do is read the places we'll be together in this next week. At 5.30 this afternoon evening, Marion Soil and Water Conservation District 2014 Annual Meeting, Creekside Golf Club, 6250 Clubhouse Drive, Southeast in Salem. Tomorrow, 5.45 to 7.30, a Candidates Forum in Woodburn, Country Meadows Village, 155 Evergreen Road, 
in Woodburn. Monday, the 27th, 8.30, Commissioner Calendar Review, Silverton Conference Room, 5th floor, 555 Court Street, Northeast in Salem. That's followed at 9 o'clock with management update in the same location, Silverton Conference Room. At 11 to noon, Board of Commissioners Chief Administrative Officer meeting, also in Silverton Conference Room. Tuesday, 8.30 to 10, Community Corrections Board, Silverton Conference Room. And then at noon to 1.30 on Tuesday, the 28th, Marion County Public Safety Coordinating Count, uh, Council Steering Committee, Silverton Conference Room. And then a big event, Wednesday, 7 o'clock to 8.30 on the 29th, 7 o'clock 8.30 a.m., the 6th Annual Giving People a Second Chance Community Breakfast, and that's at Broadway Commons, Highland Grant Room, 1300 Broadway Street, Northeast in Salem, and then next Wednesday at 9 o'clock, our next board session here in the Senator Hearing Room on the first floor of Courthouse Square, 555 Court Street, Northeast. So, we have a moment. Anything anybody would like to talk about? I'll just mention the breakfast is coming together very nicely, and um, thanks to Community Services Department, uh, Tammy and Sarah particularly are doing a lot of work on it, and then also in our uh, board office, Jolene and Gordine and uh, others are working really hard to get everything together. So we have a, uh, and then, um, the video is, the, we have two videos that we're working on with Allied Video, and the theme is going to be around uh, the impacts of incarceration on children and families. And so we spent, uh, Jolene went out with me, and Mark Hernandez actually did most of the taping out at parole and probation. We spent about four hours out there, and uh, people talked about their children and their own family experiences, so we have some really compelling interviews. I then did a little bit more work in the studio after that, and brought a uh, couple actually children in of uh, a couple of the clients that we interviewed and the, and the other set of interviews. So I think it's going to be good. I think everybody's going to really enjoy it. Oh, I, I have in the past. And it's always been. But I wonder, maybe just take a moment. I know you'd like to do this because two or 300 people will be there, and obviously there's a whole bunch of other people in the county don't really know what it's all about and the good that it does. Could you talk about that just for a little bit and how it's grown? I, I've <laughs> kind of seen from the beginning, and now you're bolting at the seams. Right. Well, um, like we said, this is the sixth annual breakfast. So we started out with this idea that uh, because we have um, Marion County Reentry Initiative that uh, about six years ago was coming together. So the Reentry Initiative is a partnership or collaboration. It includes the Marion County Sheriff's Office. They supervise people who are on parole or probation. We have when I, when I used to do the talking points, I used to say we have 600 people a year coming out of prison into Marion County. Now we say we have 500 people a year. So because of the drop of the re, in the recidivism rate, people not going back in, it's actually dropped the number of people coming back to the community because they're not doing the revolving door. Uh, we have roughly, I say 4,000, I think it's closer to 3,700 people on parole and probation. That used to be 5,000 when I started doing the talking points. So again, we, we've come way down in terms of the numbers of people that are on supervision as well. But that's the foundational piece. And the approach that uh, the parole and probation officers use, and Wendy Bales, who's on the video, talks about this, has changed dramatically over the years. So it used to be that people would kind of, uh, the parole and probation was really about telling people what they should and shouldn't do, and also kind of trying to catch people when they messed Stuff up and right. send them back to jail or send them back to prison. And now the whole focus is on trying to help people be successful. So it's really a totally different approach. And, uh, and you see so much respect and bonding b back and forth in these interviews. And it was neat when, you know, when people were lined, some of them sat there for over two hours waiting to be interviewed. I felt terrible about that. But, you know, they would be like hugs and smiles and, you know, just opportunities for people to feel like they'd really made a change in their lives and really made a difference. We have nonprofits that are working with us, Bridgeway, works on treatment services, uh, community action helps with uh, the Demunis Resource Center. Uh, we have uh, family building blocks, just got a grant from Oregon Community Foundation. They're working on parenting. We hold the SOAR uh, program at Chemeketa Community College. Union Gospel Mission's been a great partner. They've helped a lot with housing and um, other services. Uh, so, and I'm leaving out some, but you get the idea that there's just a lot of community folks that are working together to make this happen. So the concept behind uh, the reentry initiative is that you take people when they're coming out of prison to help them be successful. We actually start with a reach-in 
uh, before they leave Six prison. Months. So the nonprofit partners and those parole and probation officers go in to the prison and meet with people three to six months before they get out. And what uh, kind of an interesting uh, benefit or uh, result that came out of that that nobody really expected was that before we started that process, about a third of the people that came out of prison never showed up at the parole and probation office when they were supposed to, which is within, I think, the first 24 to 48 hours. And now that they're going into the prison and doing the reach in, it's like 3% that don't show up. So words got back, this will be helpful to you. Well, it? yeah. And also, you know, it's just kind of the same concept of if you're, if you don't know where to go, if you don't have a face and connected with the name, you're kind of going, uh, you know, I don't know who this person is. I'm feeling uncomfortable about that. You kind of blow it off. But if you actually know the person before and you know where you're supposed to go, it's just, it just makes it easier. So, um, so that's what they discovered. And then after they get out of, uh, prison and, and get their plan in place. Uh, some of them were put into the SOAR program at Chemeketa, which is a, a whole lot of services wrapped together, treatment services, parenting classes, employment help. There are employment specialists that help everybody. There um, are treatment programs for people that need it, what they call cognitive behavioral therapy or classes. I think that's for, what you try a meal all the time. All right, it? that's changing the way you think yeah, about huh, things. Yeah, I've, yeah, I've been working on you for a long time. <laughs> um, let's see. And uh, we had a mentoring program through Mid Valley Mentors, and that program has dissolved in terms of volunteer mentoring, but we still have paid mentors that are working through Bridgeway. And um, I, we were doing the calculation. We think probably close to a couple hundred clients have mentors through the paid mentoring program. So not everybody, but certainly quite a few. So anyway, the whole impact of, of children and families is the idea that... Uh, in order to change the dynamic of the next generation coming up who, if they grow up with parents that are involved in criminal activity, they have you know, access to drugs, access to kind of the attitudes and values that, of a family that's not um, moving forward. Time, right, and one of the statistics I just put on the PowerPoint is that uh, from these national studies, about 75% of children who are, infected, who are affected by incarceration come from families where there um, is where the families are split. They're either divorced or there's only one parent in the home. So that means that they're growing up in a situation, poverty, stress, abuse, family violence, drugs and alcohol, which certainly doesn't guarantee that someone deals with criminal behavior, but certainly the likelihood goes up because that's the environment that you're raised in. So by helping the parents become uh, clean and sober, getting a good job, changing their friends, living in a different environment, being stronger family members. And even if the father is not in the home, having the father have a presence with the children and learning that they need to pay child support and they need to be there for their kids, all of that is strengthening families and helping the next generation also so that they're not the group that we see 10 to 20 years from now in our juvenile department or prison in our jails. You know, I've told you this story before, and the your program helps hundreds, perhaps thousands, but what brought it home was a, a childhood friend of mine ran into him there, and uh, he took me aside and he says, Sam, this program and that lady there saved my life. That's what, you know, that's mm -hmm. where I owe. Yeah. It is for real. And Kevin serves on yeah. the Governor's Reentry Council and has been very active in this as well. Yeah, and, and I want to just... Um, give kudos to Commissioner Carlson because your leadership and I remember um, when I when I went through the appointment process with the two with the three of you um, Commissioner Milne was here at the time I was listening to what you thought some of the issues were and it's it's um, you thought you had good relationships between your city and your counties but you didn't have good relationships between your state and the counties and and I never forgot that and did things there to open up the door and worked a lot. I mean, there were your bills, basically. I just put my name on them. Um, and, you, you know, just the things that you can see that it's, it's taken. I remember sitting there in my first governor's reentry um, council meeting and them talking about these obstacles to people being successful. And it took three years to, to get IDs moving, right? I mean, just the, the hard thing it is to get the state to move on some of those. So, my, my hat's off to you and your leadership and, and whatever I can do to continue to support it. And I want to make a little um, segue because I sat in, in, Vance, in Judge Day's um, vet court two Fridays ago and it brought me to tears watching 
and listening to what was going on in that room and what those men and women had gone through, potentially we don't even know about, but what they're trying to deal with. And then I'm speaking with a neighbor friend of mine who is a retired Navy, is actually an attorney, retired Navy, and he's worked a lot on helping with reentry from um, people coming into the military. And I brought up the reach-in issue to him. And that's one of the problems that with military people coming back. He said they don't even know where to go. They don't even know the resources are out there. And I thought if we could find a way that we could identify people who are coming out of the service who had been engaged in combat or overseas and reach into them six months with the resources that we have here in the state, even though they're somewhere else in the country or in the world, maybe it's a phone call or television camera, and start those relationships with the officers that are here helping them re-enter to connect them up. Maybe we'd get the same types of results where people would actually be getting services that they need that they don't even know are there. So this was just a discussion I was having last week with them. And I'm going to talk with um, the, the people who are working on the court over there and talk about how maybe those things could even happen for prevention purposes. And we're having a work session on veterans coming up, and that would be a good topic yeah. to add into that. Yeah, so work session. Great work. It is making a difference. I know that it's not a it's not a what do you call it a sexy subject to right. the public. It's a if, mature ask, is what it, it Dick very, Nelson. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> because it makes a difference in 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 people's lives. I mean, that's the number one thing, but also in our resources too. So. All right. Thank you. Anything else? No. All right. Then let's call this meeting adjourned. Go ahead.